Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep IAS. Very very warm good evening to everyone. I hope all of you are doing absolutely fine. I welcome you all back to today's session of the Hindu news paper analysis. The place where we discuss the most important news stories of the day's Hindu newspaper from both the mains and the prelims point of view. Just a reminder once again and I hope all of you know by now the 5 pm timing that we have was just for 2 days. From tomorrow onwards, we are going back to our original timing of 10 a.m. So don't forget to join us tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. for the next newspaper analysis session because the 5 p.m. timing ends after the session today. Now let's see what are the important articles that we have here for you from today's Hindu newspaper. We will be discussing these eight articles in detail. Four of these more important for the mains examination point of view. There is an article on. data protection how the government of india should utilize the data protection laws in the country then we have an article on foreign universities being asked to set up their campuses in india there is an article written on how it would be very difficult for a foreign university to be successful in india then we will be discussing about the recent saudi arabia and iran deal a surprise deal that not many countries were expecting china as you know negotiated a peace deal between the two sides that have not really been on good terms for many decades now then we will discuss about a news coming in from the field of science about superconductors has there been a new discovery in the field of superconductors how is it that we can actually improve that then from prelims point of view yesterday was a big day there were oscar awards oscars were given out and there were two big winners from india and i am sure all of you know the two big winners so we'll be discussing just a bit about one specific winner that is the elephant whisperers that this is a documentary on netflix which tribe is it based on what is the importance of that tribe more specifically that is what we'll be discussing we will not be discussing more about the natu natu song i hope all of you know this by now but we'll more be focusing on the tribes that are behind the elephant whisperers then we'll be discussing about how the sipri report has come out where again it has been shown that india is the largest importer of arms once again then there was a vulture survey conducted and in the end we'll be discussing a bit about what is happening in cambodia one of our neighbors where china's influence is increasing what is it that we have to remember so let's begin without waiting any further with the very first topic that we want to discuss from the hindu newspaper today the first topic in simple terms is on the concept of data protection now if we have been following the news in the past few years you would have seen there has been a lot of talks about the data protection bill let me first explain what is exactly the issue here as more and more of us are using online apps as everything in our lives has become online be it banking be it you watching our videos be it any single activity that you do all of these are becoming online and you give out a lot of data to social media websites for example you put out photos you put out videos on social media you update where you are exactly you write your post the question is the data that you are uploading on a social media website let's say you upload a photo on instagram you upload a post on facebook etc does that company has the right to use that data given by you can facebook sell your data or not let me give you a very simple example let's assume you are someone who keeps on putting photos of bikes motor bikes because you love bikes so each and every photo of yours has some kind of a motor bike now in india let's assume there's a company that is now making a new bike and they want to sell their bikes to people so this company will go to facebook and they will ask facebook give us the list of those people who keep on putting photos of bikes only because they are the best people who can buy our bikes so that we can market our bike to them only facebook will then sell that data to the bike company and in turn they will make money this is how facebook usually earns their ad revenue when people give ad on facebook facebook claims that we will show your ad to those people who are much more likely to buy your product how does facebook get this information because of the way that we behave online for example if i am someone who keeps on talking about a a particular political party whenever i post about something facebook knows that i may be a supporter of that political party so this is how that data becomes important 
Now, this is about social media websites. Similarly, there are also issues when you use your online, when you use your apps, etc., for banking purposes, for financial transactions. Many countries around the world understand the fact as more and more people are going online, there is a huge amount of data that is being created, which is extremely important and it has to be protected. So many governments have been trying to bring this law. In India, we have not really been able to make a very strong law for data protection so far. This article is written on that topic only. The article says that now that we have the G20 summit, India should learn from the other countries as well. We have made a lot of progress in digital technology. For example, UPI is something that the entire world really appreciates. UPI is a technology using which India has been able to ensure that the online transfer becomes much more easier as compared to any other country. But we are still lacking when it comes to a lot of other data related activities. We still have not been able to make sure that the data protection laws are transparent, secure and conducive. This is what we must now work towards. The article makes a mention of something very interesting. DEPA. There is something called data empowerment and protection architecture. Now, what exactly do we mean by this? In the year 2020, Niti Aayog launched something called DEPA. Please understand this very carefully. Data empowerment and protection architecture. This is a kind of a management tool, meaning that if, for example, let's take another example. Let's say I want to invest some money in some stock market or whatever. Now, the stock market app will want details of my bank account. They will want me that what is your bank account number, where is your bank account, etc. So they would want a lot of data from my bank account or my personal data, which I should not be giving. However, before I give this data to those companies, in between there will be a tool called DEPA. They will ask me for my consent do I agree to share my data with these financial companies or not? Only when I say yes, then the data will be shared. This responsibility of coming in between, of ensuring that the customer's consent is taken every single time that my data is being shared, that in between intermediary is called the DEPA, Data Empowerment and Protection Architecture. This is an authority that will come in between to make sure consent of the users is taken every single time before the data is shared. The problem with this is it has been about more than two years since DEPA has been working, but there are still concerns about their effectiveness. How have they been storing the data, etc. So in short, even today, we do not have answers for perfect data protection in India. The authors say that India is fast becoming a digital economy. Every single person in India right now accesses internet for a lot of things. You might not go to bank for many months, many days because all the things that you want to do are happening online. You keep on logging on to your social media websites every single day. The websites that you use know so much more about you than anything else. Have you realized, and just try and answer this, have you realized ever that let's say today you are in your home, in your room, talking to your friend, and you are just talking about the fact that we should play badminton. Badminton is a very good thing. We should play badminton from tomorrow. All of a sudden, you will see that you will start seeing ads of badminton rackets. You will all of a sudden start seeing ads of shuttlecocks. All of a sudden, you will start seeing ads of where can you play badminton in your city. Have you realized this ever? You do not even search for it. You just talk within your room, closed door with just your friend and you will realize all of a sudden you start getting all those ads. How does that happen? Because the phone that you have with you that is listening to you every single second, even your conversation that you actually do in physical life, you are not searching for it even once. You are just talking to someone and your phone is just kept close to you, that phone is listening to you and they know that, oh, this guy wants to play badminton. Although this guy will only play badminton for two days, but let me sell the badminton racket to him. That is how this agencies or ad agencies work. So now they have become so effective, so important that they have a lot of data about us. Now just imagine 
anything that you are doing in your personal life is not really personal because all your data is being shared by all these companies. This is why we require DEPA. What do they do? As I told you, they ensure that every user first is asked for permission only then that data is shared. The other story is who owns the data? Who owns the data? Meaning that let's take an example. If I uploaded a photograph of myself on Facebook, now is Facebook the real owner of that photograph? Can they sell that photograph wherever they want? Or is it still my photograph? Who owns that data? Facebook can say that you chose to upload it on Facebook, meaning that you have given that data to Facebook. Now Facebook will do whatever they want. Who owns that data? That is still not very clear. All these things have to be sorted out in the data protection laws and data protection policies that we have. This is a question of data sovereignty. Data sovereignty means the country's government wants that we should control the data of our citizens, that we should have something called data localization. There is something of a debate called data localization. Now, what exactly do we mean by data localization? When Again, we'll take the same example of Instagram, Facebook, etc. Whatever. Let's say you upload a photo, you upload a post there. If the government of India does not like it, the government of India will ask Twitter or Facebook to take that down. But Facebook or Twitter, for example, will say that our servers where this photo or video is being stored, those servers are not in India. Those servers are in USA. So they will abide by US laws and not Indian laws. The government of India does not like it. The government of India wants that all the data of Indian citizens should be stored in India and not anywhere else in the world. Usually these big companies, Facebook, Instagram, etc. They do not want to set up their servers in India. Why? Because they know if they set up their servers in India, it will come under jurisdiction of the government of India. Then they would give orders to remove whatever they want. They will control everything. And these companies do not want that. They do not appreciate that. So the data sovereignty issue, who owns the data? The data localization issue also has still not been solved. The government of India recently decided to set up the India Data Management Office. This will be an office or an institute that is related to the government. This will handle all the data or this will ensure that all the laws related to data protection in India are implemented properly. So on one hand, the government of India has made some efforts to ensure that we have been able to give protection or we at least make certain efforts and regulations to protect data of our citizens. But on the other hand, the implementation still remains an issue. This is a diagram just to show you in simpler terms how DEPA works. As we discussed, DEPA's main responsibility is to ensure that the user first gives permission only then the data is shared. So for example, if a wealth management company where you are investing in stock market, etc. They ask for your data. I will first, the user will first be asked for permission. They will give permission. Then the consent manager will talk to bank and then the bank will release the data. So in between the user, that is me, my bank from where the information will go and my stock uh, broker, wherever information has to go, my permission has to be given. And this DEPA, as we discussed earlier, will be the mediating authority in this regard. Now, this is what the article talks about. Let's go slightly deeper into DEPA as a concept. DEPA stands for, as we discussed, Data Empowerment and Protection Architecture. This was released in 2020 by Niti Ayo. In simple terms, they have to mediate in between the individuals and institutions that seek their data. They will appoint something called the consent managers Consent managers have to make sure that any data that is shared by any institution has to be shared only after consent is given by the individual. Not just this, the implementation will be done by RBI, SEBI, IRDA, PFRDA. Basically, all these financial institutions working in India, they will be the one who will implement this architecture. This DAPA will be used in many different fields, mainly financial fields financial sector, telecom sector, healthcare sector also because health data is also very important. You would have seen how recently 
AIM's servers were attacked by certain hackers. Did you see that news? A few months back, there was a news that came out that the servers in AIM's were hacked. Now, why would any hacker do that? AIM's servers would have information about the health of many important people. So many important people, let's say, would have gone to AIM's for checkup. All their data is stored in that server. When you know how someone's health is, when you know if some particular person has a particular health issue, you can exploit that, you can blackmail that person. So health data, their secrecy is also important. All that will become better. All that will become more transparent with the help of DEPA because the consent of an individual will be mandatory. There are some other examples around the world how different countries have been trying to ensure data protection. Whenever you talk about data protection or these kind of laws, the one country or one group that usually comes at the top which usually has the toughest laws with regards to their citizens' rights is EU. So EU, for example, has a law called European Union's GDPR. GDPR stands for General Data Protection Regulation. This emphasizes the fact that the companies should collect minimum data. The company should not collect data which is not even required. For example, a lot of times you will see that when you register on the app, Many apps will ask you which is your home city, which is your state, what is your date of birth, etc. They ask you a lot of things which they don't even require. This is what the law says, the GDPR law says only minimum data that is essentially required by the organization, only that data should be collected and not other data. USA also has a law called Open Banking Data Sharing Framework. Again, under this, consent of an individual is mandatory before sharing any data. Australia has something called My Health Record, again an example, which is a system under which you can opt out if you don't want your health records to be shared with anyone. When you go to a government hospital, they will have your health records. You can sign a form that I don't want my health records to be shared with anyone. We still, we have China also doing similar kind of things. These are just a few examples of what different countries have been doing to protect their citizens' privacy, to protect their citizens' data. As per the authors, India should learn from them in the upcoming G20 summit. We should also highlight that, see, we have also done this to protect the data. We have also taken these steps. This is what the author's point here is. Before I move on to the second article, let me quickly take up a few, law, a few questions. Okay. Um, Akansha has a question. Why government of India can't make laws like GDPR? It's not that we can't. We do. Uh, it, there, it's a different scenario altogether. See, for many companies, let's say Europe is a different market altogether. India will be a different market altogether. Now India is realizing its power. See, India has a power in the sense that we have so many people and India becomes a huge market for many companies. I'll give you an example. For example, if today India says that Facebook will be banned in India. Let's take a simple example. Today, let's say government says that Facebook is banned in India. The problem is Facebook cannot afford that because Facebook's revenue is from showing ads. India being such a huge population with so many people going online, for Facebook, India is a very lucrative market. So India can utilize that by making very strict laws, which Europe has done. Europe is a very lucrative market for most of these companies. Why? Because Europe is a market where the per capita income of an individual who is seeing those ads is very high. So per capita income in Europe is higher, so people can buy more stuff for Facebook, Google, etc. It is more important to be very active in Europe. That is why they have no option but to agree to whatever strict laws that Europe is making. India, because of a lower per capita income, for example, did not used to have that much power. Now we are realizing that now we are making much stricter laws as compared to what we used to do earlier. So it's there is no reason why India can't make such a law. We can, but again, it has to be a gradual process. Then I have a question. Kishan has a question. How uh, how will it be able to prevent deep fakes? Is there any law for deep fakes? Because there's no specific bill for publicity protection. No, there's no law for deep fakes in India. 
deep fakes is a kind of technology that European countries, US, etc., are making laws about. We are not really concerned about deep fakes right now. It is a big challenge, but there is no special law for deep fakes. This also will not really protect issues of deep fake. Okay, I'll take one more question uh, very quickly. I have a question uh, being repeated time and time again. Is that badminton thing you told is true? Yes, absolutely true. Badminton was an example, but it is absolutely true. You talk about anything and from the second day onwards, you will start seeing ads. It has happened with everyone. It will happen with you also. The reason is, and I'll tell you what happened. The reason is, when you have a phone or when you download certain apps, when you start using those apps, you would have seen, they ask you, do you agree in the beginning for many long agreements? Do you agree? Do you agree? None of us read those. We just say, yes, agree next step yes agree next step in those long 20 pages of agreements which none of us ever read and we just said yes i agree one of the points was that we will listen to you so that listening to you part is where they will listen to us and they will actually show us the ad so that is how it usually works and it is a big issue in western countries specifically see please understand you should not compare india with european countries because the stages of development are different in different societies. In India, we are at a stage where for us, our privacy is not that important for us right now. For example, if there is a poor person and I give him a choice that I will steal your data, but I will give you money in return. What would the poor person choose? The poor person will say, yes, okay, I will take money. I don't mind my data being stolen. So we are at a stage where are protecting data, protecting privacy, our concepts which we are not really concerned about. We are more concerned about our basic needs being fulfilled. After that, we will reach a stage after maybe two decades that we will be very concerned about our privacy. So it's no point protecting or comparing India with Europe right now. They are at a very different stage. Their society is very different as compared to India. Their priorities are different, which are not the same in India. Anyways, let's move ahead. Otherwise, we'll be stuck to the first topic itself. The second topic that we'll be discussing is about foreign universities coming to India. As you know, the government of India has invited foreign universities coming to or to set up their campuses in India like Cambridge, Oxford, etc. We want that their university campuses should be set up in India. Now, the problem here is, and this article is written on this topic, that it will be very difficult for foreign universities to actually set up their campuses in India and run successfully. And they have given multiple examples, multiple data points as well. Why would it be very, very difficult for any foreign university to have a successful campus running in India? Now, recently, the Ministry of Education said that a lot of Indian students go outside India to study. And that is true. Ministry of Education said in 2021, 4.4 lakh Indians went outside to study. Now that has become 7.5 lakh. In 2022, 7.5 lakh Indian students went outside India to study. Now this is because of various reasons. Number one, uh, as people's earning capacity is increasing, many people are now able to afford education outside India. So that is one factor. Second factor being availability of loan is not that difficult, especially education loans. Thirdly, our Indian institutions also ha don't have very low fee. If you actually compare the fees of Western education institution, Indian education institutions, yes, there's a difference. But even in India, the education institutions are not very cheap. In foreign countries, you still have option of scholarships, etc. In India, scholarships are almost next to zero. So a lot of students are preferring to study outside. Because a lot of them are studying outside, meaning that a lot of foreign exchange is also going out, out of India. As for the government data, from 2012 to 2022, in these 10 years, the remittances that we sent outside India on education only were over $5 billion, which is huge. Realizing this, the government had this idea, why not ask the foreign universities to set up their campuses in India only? Why not ask them set up a branch in India so that our students don't have to go anywhere? Now, this idea, for example, for me also, it's not an idea that I think would work because when a student goes outside India, there are various reasons for which they go outside and not just for the name of the campus. It is the entire environment. The author here is making a very detailed point. For example, the author is saying, let's compare the fees and the cost 
and see if they would be able to work. So the author here takes an example of IIT Madras. IIT Madras has 7,000 students as per the article. Average fee of, is about, let's say, 2 lakh rupees per year. That is the average fee that you have to pay in IIT Madras. Last year, IIT Madras had an expenditure of 1,032 crore. Meaning that if you multiply the 2 lakh per student fee with 7,000 students, just multiply that very quickly and you will see just by student's fee, the institute will never be able to cover their expenses because you just multiply that 2 lakh per year for 7,000 students. On the other hand, their expenditure is over 1,000 crore. So there is a big mismatch. The reason why IIT Madras is still able to run is because the government supports IIT Madras. The government supports and gives a lot of money to the IITs. That is how they are able to work. If there was no government support to IIT Madras, then IIT Madras would have had to take 14 lakh rupees per year as the fee. This is how they can give quality education. When foreign universities come to India, they will obviously not have government support. So if they also want to give as much quality of information and education as IIT Madras or even better, meaning that they would have to spend even more money, how will they get that money? Would a student in India be willing to pay 14, 15 lakh rupees per year as a fee? Not really. For IIMs, it's a different matter altogether. But let's say when you are going for an undergraduate program, people would not be ready to pay this much of a fee in India. Also, it's a very competitive market in India. As per the author, there are different types of universities. For example, there are Shiv Nadar University, there is Azim Premji University, which gets backing from these businesses, so they keep a low fee, so students are attracted to them. Then we have mass universities, which have medium fee and give good education like VIT, etc. Then we have other institutions which have been set up recently like Ashoka University. They also charge a slightly higher fee. So India right now has no dearth of options for higher education. So when a foreign university comes to India, please do not expect that the students will be running after these foreign universities to just get admissions there. We already have a lot of options in India. The other problem is, in India, when you go and take admission into these colleges or universities, the one thing that is at the top of your mind is how much placement package will I get? That is true with almost everyone. When you go and take admission into any college, 90% of the students have only one thing in their mind, that is, what will be the placement that I will get? You can make excuses, no, 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 I only want to study, no, I only want good this and that, but the reality is, you, you make sure that you only go to those colleges where you get a good placement packet. Now, even there, it is very difficult for foreign universities to compare. Let's take an example. IIT Madras, average salary last year was about 13 lakh per annum. Now, if you compare that, IIT Madras, let's say, had, has about 8 lakh rupees of fee, 2 lakh per year for let's say BTEC, they have 8 lakh rupee fee for the entire course and then they are offering an average pay package of 13 lakh. IIMs have a higher fee like IIM Calcutta, 31 lakh fees but they offer a package, medium package of which is very similar to what their average fees is. If a foreign university comes to India, the problem is government of India has made it mandatory that when the foreign university comes, their teachers also will be the same kind of teachers that are teaching there. So if the Harvard University comes to India, it's not that they will now hire Indian teachers just to save on the cost. They will hire someone from India to now teach so that they can reduce cost. No. Government says that if the foreign university is being set up in India, they have to offer the same kind of experience, same kind of faculties. So if a professor is teaching in Harvard in US, the same professor then comes to India. He would obviously demand same kind of salary. With the same kind of salary, would Harvard be able to keep the fee so low? No, they would have to charge a much higher fee. So when that happens, how will they provide such a high paying job in India? That is still not clear. So the students, when they decide which university to join, which college to join, the foreign universities will not be able to match up with the kind of placements that are being provided for the fees that is being charged. Just to remind you, 
the rules that UGC had made about which universities can set up their campuses in India. The UGC had said there are two types of foreign higher education institution that can set up their campuses in India. First, those which are in the top 500 global rankings. The global rankings that we have every single year. There is a QS ranking, there is a time ranking. If the institute is in top 500, they can. Secondly, if they are of reputation in their own home country. So if they are considered as a top university in their own country, then also they can come. Approval will have to be asked for by every institute on a case by case basis. A committee will be set up by University Grants Commission. They will see if approval has to be given. After approval is given, two years of time will be given to set up their campuses. These institutes will be free to decide their fee, free to decide their admission process, etc. Government of India will not interfere. Also, the faculty, as I said, should be of high quality, same qualifications as they have in their main campus. They can't compromise on the quality. They have to protect the interest of the student. They can't just leave a course midway in between and go away. And their degrees given will be considered on a similar kind of a status as the Indian degrees. These are the laws that India has made for them. It remains to be seen while the universities would be interested here or not. Over here, let me give you a very small, simple homework. I would suggest you tell me after the video ends, tell me in the comment section. Recently, there is a university that has become the first university to show interest in setting up a foreign campus in India. Which university is that? Try and find out if you already know, great. Then tell me in the comment section later on, which is the first foreign university that has now shown interest that we want to set up a campus in India. Anyway, let's move on then. The next important news, a news that is seen all around the world right now, that China has been able to do something which is unthinkable. China has been able to bring two countries together, the two countries which were not even ready to talk to each other. That is Saudi Arabia and Iran. Since the 1970s, Saudi Arabia and Iran have had a lot of issues between them. The two sides have been involved in proxy wars in different countries altogether. Basically, although both of these are Islamic countries, but the issue is that one of them is a Sunni dominated country, while the Iranian country, for example, is a Shia dominated country. Now, because of this dispute between Saudi Arabia and Iran, both of these countries want to be recognized as the true leader of the Islamic world. And this is why there is a clash between the two. The two sides have never been on good terms with each other. While Saudi Arabia has always had great relationship with the US, Iran has always had very bad relationship with the US. Both of them are involved in proxy wars. Both of them have had multiple issues between them. I'll discuss some of those issues as well. For example, a few years back, we saw that a very famous Shia cleric in Saudi Arabia was executed, means was given the death sentence. Now, Iran, since it's a Shia dominated Shia majority country, Iran protested in return, in exchange, in Iran, the Saudi Arabia embassy was attacked. The Saudi Arabia embassy was attacked by the local population. Iran government did not protect it. Saudi Arabia wanted to send its own team for investigation in their embassy. But Iran said, no, we will not allow. We will only allow if we see that you are protecting the Shia population in your country. Only then we will allow you guys to come and have investigation in our country. So these are just few examples of the larger issue between Saudi Arabia and Iran. The two sides that have not been talking for a long, long time. They have even been involved in proxy wars. Proxy wars means not fighting directly, but trying to harm each other's interests. For example, the two sides have been trying to harm each other's interests in Yemen. So in Yemen, there is a civil war for a long time where the Saudi Arabia government supports the Yemen government. On the other hand, the Houthis, the group that is harming the Yemen government that is supported by Iran. So there are a lot of issues that we still see between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And it is very surprising that China has been able to bring them together and broker peace. Now, the details of the agreement, what will the two sides do? What have they agreed to? They have still not been released. 
but experts say that two or three points have been agreed to. For example, first point that have been agreed to is Iran has agreed to prevent attacks against Saudi Arabia. They will ask the Houthi rebels in Yemen not to attack the Saudis. Number one. On the other hand, Saudis say that they will support Iran's news channel called Iran International. They will support that channel to be propagated around the world. Now, what is this news channel story? See, countries around the world, especially the countries which are not truly democratic, they realize the importance of media much more than any other country. They realize the importance that if the government can control a media organization, it can carry the government's propaganda to not just the country but around the world. For example, you would have heard about uh, Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera, for example, and I would like you all to tell me which country runs Al Jazeera news channel. Al Jazeera, for example, is run by a country and it propagates the ideology of that country without speaking against its own country but talking about the world affairs. Similarly, Iran also wanted to do the same. Iran wanted to launch a channel called Iran International which did not get support from anyone. So Saudi Arabia is saying, okay, we will give support to you. As many people are saying in the chat correctly. Al Jazeera run by Qatar. So basically, there are countries that want to control media or if not control then have their own media channel for example china the chinese government has their own newspaper the name of that newspaper is global times they have given it a name such that you will not expect that this is a chinese newspaper you expect some other name for a chinese newspaper but the name is global times Global Times carries out news stories in favor of Chinese government day after day after day. Every single day in Global Times there will be a news that India has entered China, India is coming at our border, India is bad, etc, etc. So when you search anything online and you see a link of Global Times, I request you not to open it up. If you open it up, then at least don't believe whatever they are saying. So many countries run these kind of channels that propagate their ideas. Iran also wants to do the same. Saudi Arabia said that we will accept this. Now the question is why is it that Iran or Saudi Arabia have tried to enter the deal? What is it that they have to achieve now by coming closer to the other country? Now please understand something very carefully. So far in the history of the Middle East, many peace deals have been signed. But in all those peace deals, USA was always a part of it. Without USA, there was almost no peace deal that was signed. This is the first time ever that it is not US but China that has now negotiated between the two countries and signed a peace deal. Now let's try and understand from the point of view of both countries. Let's talk about Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, as you know, has always been a very close ally of US. Their story goes back to 1945. So in 1940s, when the world realized that Saudi Arabia can be a very important country because of oil, because of all the mineral reserves they have. Saudi Arabia and USA have a very old agreement. The agreement between the two is simple that Saudi Arabia has exported its security to US. So US has guaranteed we will give you security whenever you want. Whatever weapons you want, whatever security you want, we will protect you. In return, what you have to do is number one, you have to make sure you keep on giving us oil. Second, most important thing, Saudi Arabia has to agree that we will sell oil to other countries only in exchange of dollar and no other currency. This was famously called the petrodollar deal. <clears throat> the petrodollar deal was, as I said, Saudi Arabia agrees that we will give oil to US and also, if we sell oil to any other country, we will only sell oil in dollars so that American currency becomes the most demanded currency in the entire world. It becomes the most sought after currency. And USA will agree that, okay, we will provide you whatever security that you want. Now, what has happened is in the past few years, Saudi-US relations are not that great as they used to be. Why? Number one, US has found its own oil reserves. They have the shale gas boom. They now have new oil reserves. In fact, so much so that USA is now exporting oil. So USA is not dependent on Saudi Arabia for oil anymore. Number one. So they are moving away from Saudi Arabia. Secondly, 
with Saudi Arabia they have had certain issues for example Saudi Arabia it's not a democratic country so the kind of decisions that they take we will attack someone we will kill someone whenever someone speaks against us all of this goes against the interest of the US when the 9-11 attacks happened after when the investigation went on for example Osama bin Laden was a Saudi citizen at the end of the day so there were a lot of links to Saudi Arabia even after terror attacks now that is why Saudi Arabia now is not really a top priority for US anymore as you would have seen now USA is more focused on Indochina they are more focused on the Pacific Ocean they are more focused on cod NATO they are lesser focused on what is happening in the Middle East so Saudi Arabia realized this and that is why because US is not prioritizing in the Middle East many Middle Eastern countries are coming together to sign their own deals for example when Donald Trump was the president Abraham Accord deal was signed <clears throat> between UAE and Israel UAE and Israel also <clears throat> resolved their differences similarly many other countries in the Middle East have resolved their differences with Israel all these changes are happening in the Middle East when USA has not been prioritizing the Middle East Saudis now think that they want new friends in the region and that is how they have come closer to Iran now what about Iran what about them why have they accepted this Iran because of all the sanctions imposed on them by Western nations Iran is going through a very tough time economically they want as much help as possible from different countries to revive their trade China has become the closest partner of Iran for the last few years China Iran in fact signed a deal of 400 billion dollars China said we will do a lot of development in Iran in exchange for your oil we'll sell you weapons etc as well Iran also realizes that their funds are frozen in many countries if they become friends with some countries that will just be better for them that is why Iran has accepted this but it is said that the biggest winner out of this agreement is not Iran not Saudi Arabia but China see when countries say we are a global power we are a superpower the superpower tag or the global power tag is given to you when you can resolve such differences between different countries anyone can resolve differences within your country but if you had some power that you can negotiate between two countries that were not even talking to each other for many decades that is when you build your global stature so China is building that global stature as a country which is investing a lot of money in Saudi Arabia also and investing a lot of money in Iran as well they are doing what USA used to do earlier USA was so proud we are the only country that can negotiate between two enemies but China is saying you are not the only one now we also can do the same and this is why we see a lot of changes happening in Saudi Arabia countries talking to each other making new friends and making sure that their relationship becomes better <clears throat> I'll take one question uh, <clears throat> Sahil for example has a question why USA only can impose sanctions against any country it's not that US only can impose sanctions India can also impose sanctions so basically what is what do you mean by imposing sanctions so <clears throat> when USA says that we will impose sanctions that means that if any of your company's money is in US bank account we will not give it back if you have invested in US government bills we will not buy those bills whatever so whatever money whatever interest you have in US those are all frozen India can also put sanction but we know countries have not invested money in our country so even if we freeze them even if we put sanction nothing will happen only those countries can put sanctions which can claim that we have a lot of investment from the outside world only those countries can have this power we will put sanctions on you we will not give you money back because our bank accounts have a lot of your money that is how US can every country can put sanction there is no limit on who can put sanction who cannot USA knows that their sanction will be the most effective this is the only difference okay one last Iran is asking why is Iran requires permission from Saudi Arabia for their new channel they don't require any permission Saudi Arabia just said that we will support your channel so we will also make sure that your channel is televised in our country in other countries as well which are our friends because the channel becomes more powerful when it is not just seen in Iran but outside Iran as well so Saudi Arabia said we will help you doesn't mean that you need our permission 
let's move on then the next article that we have is from science about something called semi or superconductors now what is superconductors how does it work let's try and understand see when you transmit energy more like electricity if let's say from point a to point b you are transmitting electricity there will always be some loss in between these are usually called AT&T losses so basically whatever AT&T losses for example all these losses that we have in between this is because the wire would have certain resistance against this electricity flowing in them all these wires any transmission cable that you have will have at least some loss in energy so let's say if you transfer 100 units from here only 85 will reach till point B and not 100 why because there is some resistance in between in between if this material is made up of something called superconductors superconductors theoretically are those materials which will have zero resistance meaning that there will be no loss of energy whatever you transmit will reach the end point this is a superconductor now it's easy to say that that we should use superconductors there should be no loss of energy but the problem is superconductors making them is very very difficult there are some elements that work as superconductors but only under very 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 extreme circumstances for example aluminium becomes a superconductor but only at minus 250 degree celsius so how will you keep aluminium at minus 250 degree celsius and then pass electricity that is not possible so there are some materials that become superconductor but at very extreme temperature very extreme pressure etc the scientific community for a long time has been trying to see if we can make superconductors at room temperature as well are there some elements or are there some compounds that will work as superconductors even in room temperature or not that is what the entire scientific community is after there have been some examples of what has happened in 2019 for example german scientists found that lanthanum hybrid this can work as a superconductor at minus 20 degree but under very high pressure how high million atmospheres of pressure the pressure that is at the center of the earth so that is also just not possible now why this news has come in in the newspaper is some researchers have found out in the USA that there may be a breakthrough in superconductors they have found out that nitrogen doped lutetium hydride may act as superconductors at lesser pressure as well which is possible to be used at many library many laboratories around the world so superconductivity as a subject has again come back in the news why because some scientists have found out that maybe we will be able to make superconductors at lesser pressure which is feasible for us in the long run now superconductivity in this experiment was mainly because of nitrogen that could induce the right amount of jiggling jiggling means basically the flow of electrons so that the uh, current can be transmitted however the problem is in this experiment that was conducted there are a lot of questions that have been asked many scientists have asked questions that something that was not done for so many years how come all of a sudden overnight some scientists claim that we have developed new superconductivity many scientists are saying that the data collected about resistance is not the correct way to conduct the experiment they are saying that this data still needs to be checked the manner in which this experiment was conducted still is questionable and we do not agree with this now whenever there are questions on these kind of experiments that means that it will not really be asked in the UPSC so UPSC will not really ask you how was this experiment conducted what are the question marks etc but the UPSC might ask you something about superconductors or the application of superconductivity superconductivity's main application as you know is to ensure that there is minimal loss of energy that the efficiency of all these instruments become much much better efficiency of motors cables transformers all of this becomes such so so much better when 
we have superconductivity which is used here. This is where the application of superconductivity comes into picture. There are two important phrases I would like you all to remember for prelims point of view. There is something called the Meissner effect. Meissner effect means when a material transits from normal to superconducting state, it excludes magnetic fields from its interior which is called the Meissner effect. So letting go of magnetic fields from its interior when the material transforms into a superconductor that is called the Meissner effect. Then there is another phrase called critical temperature. Critical temperature means a temperature at which the resistivity will drop down to zero and the material will con convert itself into a superconductor. So that is called critical temperature. Temperature at which it gets transformed into superconductors. Do remember these two phrases for the Pillings point of view more specifically. This was mainly from the mains point of view. Now it's time for us to discuss some Pillings specific news, more of factual news stories that you should remember. First big news that had the entire country celebrating yesterday was the Oscars that were announced and we had big winners. We had winners in the form of Natu Natu and we had the best documentary short film given to Elephant Whisperers, a movie that you can see on Netflix as well. Now, rather than actually going through what were the award, what were the category that was given, more importantly for us, it is important to focus on the tribal group based on which this documentary the elephant whisperers was made now it's a very very beautiful documentary it's about a 40 minute movie that you can see on netflix as well now this movie is based on a tribe called the cartoon icon tribe and if you see the documentary in the very first minute they tell you the word cartoon icon means the king of the forest because this is the tribe that have been living in the forest for a long long time for many generations Cartoon Icon Tribe is one of the 75 particularly vulnerable tribal groups. Now what is this? The government of India 1970s realized that even among the scheduled tribes in India, we have certain tribes that are even more backward as compared to other scheduled tribes. And they were called the particularly vulnerable tribal groups. They are total of 75 tribal groups which are in this category for which the government usually brings in more or exclusive schemes. Most of these tribes out of 75, most of them are found in the state of Odisha, but they are found in other parts of the country as well. The Cartoon Icon tribe mainly lives in Tamil Nadu and in Kerala in different parts, mainly in forest. They are hunter gatherers. They do some agriculture activities as well. They uh, rear honey, uh, forest pepper, etc. They have a different language which is called the Cartoon Icon language. It is based on the Davidian family of languages only. Do remember about the tribes. Do remember about the fact that they have the PVTG status and any other government scheme that the government introduces for them. Also reminding you yesterday we did an entire 10 minute big news video on the Cartoon Icon tribe only. If you have not watched that I would highly recommend you to watch it. Just a 10 minute video on our YouTube channel where we discuss everything about the Cartoon Icon tribe in detail, their language, their culture, the role of indigenous tribes in conserving our environment. Do watch that, it's important. Now also, if you look at very quick history of the Oscar winners in India, there have been a few only. In 1983, Bhanu Uthaya won it when she was a costume designer for the famous movie Gandhi. 2009, the year of Slumdog Milena was a golden year when we had multiple Oscars. 1992, Satyajit Ray, what he won was not in a competition. Satyajit Ray, the director, was given a lifetime achievement kind of an award. Others were in the competition and now we have two other Oscars that have been coming in. So again, something that you must remember because this is not something that happens every single year. Multiple Indian projects giving, winning Oscar, this is not a very usual occurrence. So do read about that as well. The next article is about the CIPRI report. The CIPRI report that usually tells the world which countries are importing and exporting weapons. 
their reports tell us about which countries are buying the most weapons from outside the countries. India usually, as you know, comes at the top. The report says that in the five-year period from 2018 to 2022, India has been importing the most weapons in the world, although the number of weapons that we have exported has declined, but as compared to other countries, we are still importing a lot of weapons. Now, please do remember one thing. By the way, those who are asking the full form of CPRI, let me write it here. CPRI stands for Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. It's a think tank that gives this report about the global arms status. SIPRI, Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. Now, this report has some very interesting data. First data that they have is that the global arms import globally around the world is decreasing. Global arm import is decreasing. India is still at the top when it comes to importing arms. There is one other thing that you must understand. Many people confuse this by thinking India is importing the most arms means we are buying the most arms. These are not the same. Please understand. India importing the most arms is not the same as India buying most arms. There is a big difference between the two. Why? USA buys the most weapons, but because they are buying from within the country, within the US, that is not counted as import of arms. Do you understand this? China buys many more weapons as compared to India. But because China buys it from within their own companies within China, so that is not counted as import. So when we say India imports the most weapons, that means we are buying the most from outside India. Please remember that. China, US, they buy more weapons in India, but from within their country, so their import is not as such. But import is not equal to buying. These are two very different things. Now from where exactly are we getting the arms? Most of the weapons that we have are from Russia. 45.1% again although our weapon buying from Russia is decreasing but still most of our weapons still come from Russia then we have France, US, Israel, South Korea, UK from where the weapons come in then what about some other countries like Russia where are they exporting weapons most of Russia's weapons go to India then to China and then to some countries such as Egypt as well China also is a big, big arms exporter. China is the top five arms exporter in the world. Can you tell me which country buys most of the Chinese weapons? It's, I think, an easy guess. What do you think? Which country buys the most Chinese weapons? Don't Google it. Just tell the first name that comes to your mind. The first name that comes to your mind would be correct. Pakistan. Yes, Pakistan. Absolutely correct. So, about 58%, about 58% of Chinese exports in weapons go to Pakistan only. China is a very curious case. China imports a lot of weapons also and they export the weapons also. Why? Because what China does, China imports the weapons, they reverse engineer, they see, they open up everything, every nut and bolt, they see how is it made, then they make a copy and then they reduce the price by 20%, they say we are giving a 20% discount and then they sell it to the other countries. That is what China usually does. The best technique, they will place an order, they will call France, we want your Rafals, how many, 200, 100, how many Rafals, no, only two Rafals we want. One we will fly, other we will open up. So we will open up the Rafal, we will see what exactly is the component that Rafal has, how is it made, we will reverse engineer that, we will make our own and then we will sell to other countries. That is what China usually has been doing. Russia's arm exports mainly go to India. Russia has also been sending a lot of arms to China, to countries such as Egypt, Algeria, Belarus, etc. From the CIPRI report, if you see, this is a list of countries that import most of the weapons. India is at the top. As I said, India imports most weapons. We don't buy most weapons. I'll give you one more example. There's a company called Lockheed Martin. Okay. Lockheed Martin is a big US company that makes fighter jets. So if USA 
buys let's say 100 fighter jets from Lockheed Martin that doesn't mean they are importing it because it is a US company if India would buy even 50 of them then we are importing them so for India when we buy from a US company that's importing when US government buys from US company that is not importing so importing is different buying is different USA China they buy much more weapons but from their own country so it doesn't come in a definition of importing India has to import there is one more very interesting data here if you look at in 2013 to 2017 which region of the world imported most arms and then look at 2018 to 2022 which region imported most arms all the regions except one except one region of the world all other regions have decreased their arms import there is only one region that has increased its arm import do you know which region that, that is Europe as expected after the Ukraine Russia war a lot of European countries have started to buy weapons in large 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 numbers Poland, Sweden, Germany, France, the countries that were not really buying weapons earlier, Ukraine itself, all these countries are buying weapons. Europe is the only major region in the world that has increased its arms import. All other regions have decreased their arms import in the last five years. It is only Europe that has increased it. Europe has been buying a lot of weapons from US, Israel, etc., from South Korea also. That is because of the Ukraine Russia war. Two more uh, small uh, news stories to discuss from prelims point of view. One news story that there was a vulture survey that was conducted recently in Tamil Nadu, Kerala and Karnataka. This was conducted in Mudumalai Tiger Reserve where it was seen that about 246 vultures were spotted. Now this survey how many of these were spotted this is not that important. What is more important is vulture as a species usually has been asked by the UPSC many times a lot of times we see questions on vultures different types of species and what is their IUCN status for example we have different vultures like oriental white-backed vulture slender build then Egyptian vulture and all of them have a different IUCN status try and remember some of them because UPSC from the environment section does ask these questions sometimes. Also with respect to vultures, there is also one more thing that usually remains in the news. That is the vulture population is declining and there is a medicine responsible for that. Which medicine? Diclofenic. Now how is this connected? Please try and understand something. How or what do vultures eat? Vultures mostly are dependent on dead animals, dead animals that actually are just lying open in the field. Vultures eat those animals. Now those dead animals which vultures then eat, if those dead animals were given diclofenic. So diclofenic is consumed by us also. It is like paracetamol. It uh, treats for pain. It, treat, it treats people for fever. So you, me, humans also consume uh, diclofenic. Diclofenic is a medicine given to many animals as well. Now when the vultures consume diclofenic that actually leads to their kidney failing and a lot of vultures have died when they feast on those animals that were given diclofenic and there were multiple diseases that now have that multiple medicines that have been found to have similar kind of a connection. Diclofenic, Nemoslide, then we have uh, Ketoprofen, we have Esclofenic, all of these have a negative impact on vultures when they consume it. Many of the vultures have died and that is why the government has banned these medicines to be given for animal treatment. That is why we see year after year the vulture population has declined considerably. The government of India has taken certain steps but the problem is since these medicines are available for human consumption as well it is very difficult to stop let's say a farmer from using the same medicine to give to their animals this is something that the government of India has been working on to control vulture population but that has not happened the last article that we have here is an article from Cambodia 
कंबोडिया एज अ कंट्री दैट वी यूजली डोंट टॉक अ लॉट अबाउट इट डजेंट हैव अ डायरेक्ट कनेक्शन विद इंडिया ऑल दो देर इज अ वेरी वेरी फेमस टेम्पल इन कंबोडिया एंड प्लीज डू टेल मी इन द कॉमेंट सेक्शन द नेम ऑफ द टेम्पल एंड द गॉड टू विच द टेम्पल इज डेडिकेटेड टू डू टेल मी इन द कॉमेंट सेक्शन एनी वे इन कंबोडिया समथिंग दैट हैज हैपन विच इज कंसर्निंग अ लॉट ऑफ कंट्रीज इज देर इज अ लॉट ऑफ फॉरन चाइनीज इन्वेस्टमेंट कमिंग इन टू कंबोडिया अ लॉट ऑफ चाइनीज मनी इज कमिंग इन टू बिल्ड इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर इन कंबोडिया एज विद मेनी अदर कंट्रीज इन कंबोडिया द ऑपोजिशन लीडर हैज बीन जेल्ड ऑन फॉल्स चार्जेस ऑपोजिशन लीडर हैज बीन गिवेन अ ट्वेंटी सेवन ईयर सेंटेंस सो वेस्टर्न कंट्रीज इंक्लूडिंग यूएस हैव स्पोकन अप अगेंस्ट वॉट इज हैपनिंग इन कंबोडिया मेनी कंट्रीज आर वरिड दैट इन कंबोडिया डेमोक्रेसी इज नॉट बींग फॉलोड बिकॉज that opposition leaders whoever are criticizing the government all of them are being jailed many people say that it is because of china chinese investment has been coming into cambodia in very very large numbers because of it their environment also is being harmed many highways are being built many infrastructure are being built china as you know plays this debt trap diplomacy where they give a lot of loan to poor countries which can't return the loan back because chinese loans are usually at a high rate of interest and then china uses that loan as a trap china uses that loan to then try and capture the territory of the country what role does india have to play as i told you we do not have a lot of direct connection with cambodia we do have the common temple connection as i discussed we have been running some programs in cambodia india runs as you know the itec program the indian technical and economic cooperation program under which we help a lot of poor countries not just in india but in africa as well under which cambodia has also been held but again india's connection with cambodia trade etc is not that high one other thing that i would like all of you to remember it is mentioned in this article also one very very important river in southeast asia including cambodia is a mekong river it has been mentioned in this article as well this river goes to china myanmar laos thailand cambodia i would like all of you to at least see there is a group called mekong ganga there is a group called mekong ganga based on two rivers ganga river from india and mekong river from southeast asia where there are six members in total there is india there are cmlv nations cambodia myanmar laos vietnam and there's thailand as well do remember the members of this group these kind of questions are asked in the past or have been asked in the past as well about groups and their members the mekong ganga group in this region is extremely important this brings us to the end finally of today's session of the hindu history analysis again reminding you from tomorrow we are going back to our original timing of 10 am please make sure that you join in live at 10 am and not the 5 pm this is just, this was just for a couple of days couple of practice questions for all of you one from science about superconductivity and one from international relation about saudi iran relations let's try and answer to that as well thank you so much for joining in for this session i hope you learned a lot of new things today don't forget to attend the quiz based on this on our telegram channel as well and do give your answers in the comment section of the question that i have asked here thank you so much for watching have a good day ahead bye bye jai hind